Thank you. It's so wonderful to be back with the body of Christ here with our friends and the fellowship and worship God together. I just have a scripture on my heart. I just wanted to read Jeremiah 17, verse 8. Verse 7, I guess it starts. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes. But its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor cease from the yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, test the mind, even to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you just take care of us, that you know our hearts. And Lord, as we walk before you, as we pour our hearts out before you, God, you see, Lord, the, the deepest parts of us. You see where we need help. You see and hear our confession. When we confess our sins before you, when we uh, cry out in our need, when we cry out in our desperation, thank you, Lord, that you are God who hears and that you take us through and you bring us, Lord, and sustain us and sustains us in times of drought. Thank you, Lord, that your power and your great grace upon us keeps us in this hour. We thank you for this time this morning and thank you for Pastor Paul and the uh, friends and, and, and brothers and sisters that we know here, sometimes some long-term friends that we know. Lord, we thank you for the body of Christ that we can share in the beauty of Christ together in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just was really blessed today as we worship God and the song, that was a, that last song was very beautiful. I'd like to be able to learn it and keep it in my mind. Uh, but uh, we're so thankful to be here, and uh, we're so thankful that in this day that God has a plan for us. That, uh, as Pastor Paul was saying, we're not focusing on the things around, we're focusing on the Lord and what he's going to do in this time. And we're hungry. We're still hungry for God. We want more of God. And we're seeing the great things that he's doing as we travel. Uh, we just want to keep following him where he takes us and leads us. We just came now from uh, Canada. Sometimes we're going to Canada when we come here. This time we're going back from Canada. Uh, Siggy's sister lives there. Crystal, she has uh, lives in Port Erie just across the river from Buffalo. We can look across the river and see Buffalo, New York. And it's a beautiful setting as you walk along the river. And we also are in a church there. Uh, there's a couple that we know from South Africa, a pastor couple that we've known for many years who have been faithful to God and just serve God and go all over the world. And just uh, really a wonderful example of God's uh, leaders. But uh, we also have plans later in this year to go back to Europe. As you know, Sydney was born in East Berlin. Uh, we have a f just a, a couple books back there. We giving him, we're giving our books away now. We have a bunch in our basement. We said, Lord, we're not going to keep them there. We're not going to take them to heaven. We want to give them away. And so you're welcome to take uh, Siggy's Bible study back there and be with your adversary. There is one book with a black cover, which is Siggy's brother. We have to sell that one. And that's uh, a testimony of how God uh, touched his life as a dislocated person from East Germany, came to Canada. God began to build things in life and gave him gifting, and he really, God gave him wealth. And he, he uh, had businesses in different parts of the world, and then he sold his business and had a trust. And in that trust, he reaches out to help people. And like in Africa, he's built a church where we go, and he's built, uh, it's a church that is really flourishing in East London, and uh, East London, South Africa. And he also built a church in Botswana, and he built a hospital in the Congo for, for women who were abused. So he's, he's really given back to the kingdom, and it's so wonderful to see when people get blessed by the Lord that they pour it back in and give it to the needs and things for the kingdom of God. I, uh, we're just so grateful for his life and the testimony he is. So later we will be going to, uh, in uh, April back to Europe, Siggy ministers in, in uh, German. She still 
is fluent in German and speaks well in German, and then we'll go um, back to South Africa in September and October. It's really dynamic. It's some hard times coming to South Africa. Sometimes they don't have electricity for six to eight hours a day. Uh, they're very, they've taken a position very anti-Israel, the, the official government. They, they uh, come out, they try to have a UN case against Israel and they say if you've ever served in the Israeli army, if you come to South Africa, you'll be put in jail. That's how strong some of the leadership is and yet the church is really thriving there and we know that there are thousands of South Africans that, uh, that support South, uh, Israel and, and we go to churches that are very strong in that respect. So we're thankful God always doing and uh, uh, Siggy uh, is, <laughs> continues to minister in power <laughs> and anointing and uh, I'm so grateful for her life and we're just trying to follow God where he leads us. You know, we're getting up there in age, you might say. We're in, we're in the age of gray hair and, and uh, age of uh, the golden years, but you know what? God is so good and we want to just give. We just want to give to the next generation. We just want to give to the next generation. Tell them how good God is and mm. reveal God's power to the next generation. They've got to carry it now. Yes. The next generation's got to carry this nation and great things are happening. Mm -hmm. I thank God for what he's doing in this time. So yeah. I just turn it over to Sidney. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you go to different stages in your life and it's amazing how you see things different just because you have walked through things. And it's a, when you think of it, there have been things I have dreamed about. Now I'm serving the Lord many, many years. And I remember how I would pray and fast for things I have already forgotten. But yet there is something so steadfast in what God is doing. And you know, when you look throughout the years, I think one of the things which are so important is that we keep on walking and that God can mature us and mold us and shape us for what he has in our life. And it's natural when you are on the other side. I mean, let's face it, there have been things you have fasted and prayed and things you have accomplished. And you wonder, what is God doing in the end of your life? Because every decade has different challenges and different way of completing your life until the Lord truly fulfills everything what he has put within us in our life. And I just thank the Lord because he is steadfast. And it doesn't matter who, what you go through, he stays there. Whoever it is to bring to purpose what you're born for. Now, I want to read something very familiar you all know by heart, and that is Psalm 23. Now it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, I so I walk to the valley of shadow of death. I fear no evil, because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Jesus. I just ask you that you do something in us as you have already moved the Lord and produced the cry. Will we consider again and again that it is worth, it, worth to lay down all our life? And I just ask you to bless the church and Pastor Paul and the worship team and the youth team and the children and the young people. Lord, bring people into this house of God so you can fill it to overflow because in this day we we need lights in the darkness. We will need people who look up and not down, who see you in the power of the resurrection. So bless your word, I pray, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 
You know, when you look at your life, we thank you so much. What, what you so important is that you know where to go. Now, I realize that in these days, it's so wonderful that you have GPS. Because when you travel, or any of us who are travel, I remember those days when you absolutely didn't know where you're going. And you know, many of us, we have a call of God in our life. Now, in 1970 or 69, is when I got my call to smuggle Bibles behind the Iron Curtain. And you, many of you read the little book, Siggy and I, which Sister Gwen wrote. And I know, as you feel the call of God in your life and the brings in your life, you still have to know where to go and how to pursue it mm -hmm. and what to do. I see many, many people who pray, but they never get there. When they pray, they have stationary prayers, and their prayers are just produced out of their desire, but they don't know how to walk in these prayers, how to pursue the high calling in Christ Jesus. And you know, as the Lord, I remember Gwen and I, we smuggled Bibles in 1970. The first time we smuggled Bible, now you have to remember, we escaped from the East, our family. And we knew what it was to smuggle because we've been smugglers since we've been kids. So smuggle coffee and chocolate and cheese so we could survive in East Berlin. Uh, in the 50s, it was very bad as the Russian occupation. And you know, as in 1970, as we took in and, and I wanted to smuggle Bibles for the Lord. And I remember coming to the station and I wondered how they're going to do it. And I had a little Volkswagen and I said, well, how many can I smuggle in this little car? She said, smuggling? She said, and she packed it, the Bibles to the roof. And I said to her, golly, that's not smuggling. That's just bringing them in. You can see it anytime, anywhere. And this judge, oh, she said, you just have to believe God is blinding the eyes of the soul. And that God just brings you in supernaturally. Now, that's easy for you to, for somebody to do who had no experience. Now, it's a whole different story if you have experienced it of smuggling and you've been dragged out and put into the barracks and searched by the police. Now that's a whole different thing than when you who have never anything experienced and you walk in in faith and you believe for something you have not experienced. And I remember as my I could not sleep all night because I said that is not smuggling. That is a suicide. And you know so it's a big miracle how we got through that border just at the time as the Russian was occupying Czechoslovakia. So we're in. That's a big long story. And as we in, now where do we go? We have the car full of Bibles. We have a map, which we can read. It's in a different language. It's all names we can't understand. It's all in Czechoslovakia, just occupied by the Russian. Now, so how did we go? We can't ask anybody. It's so dangerous. So I said to Gwen, she was, I'm in her first trip behind the Iron Curtain, called to travel with her. She'd been in a mission field for 20 years. I poked her. It was night. We couldn't ask anybody on the street. I said, you got the Holy Spirit. Why don't you ask the Holy Spirit where we should go? And she said, yeah, you're right. And she started praying. And she's telling me where to go. I don't know how she felt that I was the driver. She was telling me turn left, turn right. In a city as big as Quaker Town or bigger a huge city. So we come driving in the night about a half an hour and we stop in front of the house. She actually, the Lord actually led her to that house so we could really deliver the Bibles they have prayed for for many years. And you see, but I believe Psalm 23 is a roadmap, a roadmap of success. Because God gives maps in our life, directions, 
which we have to do. You cannot just pray and not walk. You have to be somebody who walks up on the path the Lord has made because he has made a straight path. We have to pursue and we cannot be set up. So we're just sitting and we don't walk. Now Psalm 23 to me, it's a map for my life because it's a map to succeed because every decade, every year has new challenges and I have to walk through it. I cannot sit and pray that everything is made for me. I have to walk to every day, every week, every month, every year to do what? To pursue what God wants to do in our life and through our life. Now it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want that there shall not be a lack in us. And the first of all, you have to realize when you become a sheep, you become wolf's food. When you become a sheep, you have no ability to run fast. You have no ability to defend yourself. You have only one ability in your life to trust the shepherd. And you see, many of them, the instinct of self-preservation is so strong on us that even so we love the Lord, we have a wolf nature in us, the carnal nature, the flesh nature, who will fight the very thing to submit to the Lord once in our life. Now, when you lay down your self-preservation, and this is what we say, as we yield our life, it's not one day. It's a lifestyle. It's a, it, it pursues your thinking. It, it fills your life into every area of your life. If, if you're good or bad, if you feel ugly or beautiful, if you feel strong or weak, there has to be a pursuit of a surrender, which can only comes to what to us we yield to the Lord. Now, the first thing that when the Lord is your shepherd, he will make you do things. What does he do? He will make me what? To lie down. Now, when you think of it, every position in a natural, laying, sitting, standing, running, walking, has a purpose in your life. Now, when these positions are taken away from us, or these abilities, it limits limits us. Because we have to have these abilities to fulfill every area of our life. Now the first thing that the Lord does, when you think of our positions, you're born lying down. You're not born running, you're not born sitting, you're not born standing, you actually born lying. And when you look at it in the pursuit of life, at the end of my life, I'm going to lie again. Even if I'm dying standing, you're not going to stand stiff and die. You're going to fall. You're going to lie. Because you're going out the way you came in. And you have for from that time where you lie and you're born. God makes you to lie down. Now when does he make you to lie down? Some of your energy bunnies who are full of energy, there is something will take you over to make you lie down. That's sleep. Now, you don't stand up sleeping. There's a reason God made us like that. Why? Because a runner does not get the vision of a, or a dreamer. A dreamer is one who knows to how lie down. A dreamer is knows to how to rest. A dreamer is, is knows to how to heal. And when you look in our life, in the spirit, there has to come life times in your life for your rest. Will you lie down? Because if you don't ever lie down, you will never receive dreams. Because a dream comes in your subconsciousness. 
It's not your consciousness who determines your dream. It's your subconscious which comes into the place where you find a rest in your Lord. And the Lord bypasses your consciousness, bypasses your culture, bypasses your circumstances and gives you a dream. Now, how do you get a dream? How did I get a dream in Germany traveling the world? I remember when I was the first year in Bible school, I would say to the Bible school teacher, one day I'm going to travel the world. And the Bible school teacher in German would say to me, no mission board will ever support you traveling the world. It's impossible. How did I get that? Because God bypasses my German culture. My German teaching. And when I came into a place of rest, he gave me a dream which was not born by pursuit, but which was born to the yielding as you yield to the Spirit and yield to his power. And today, as people are striving, the church has to come and yield because we need to have a new vision. We need to have a new impartation. We need to have a new strength as we see our nation is being ripped apart and the enemy is coming into houses and families and destroying what was once treasure, destroying our lives, destroying our searches, destroying the things which God wants to do. As we know, we David mentioned it yesterday and I'm thinking of it. As I looked and searched, I looked and searched for answers. I came to a woman on YouTube. Her name is Rosaria Butterfield. And she is a woman who, when a lesbian, a lesbian professor who laid the foundation for gender and, and lesbians and wrote books and was one of the forerunners. And you know, how can a woman like that, who saw the greatest liberty is to destroy the family unit and to destroy what God has created and created? And she, there was a little pastor, Presbyterian pastor. And you know, she said that she read the Bible seven times through. Through the Bibles to find argument against Christianity. And as she read the Bible seven times through, she became converted. And as she became converted, today she stands on platform in colleges. And stu with students, and she tells them that only way they're going to get free is to kill the very thing which is killing our society and kills that. What God has created. So when the Lord raises up people, he makes his what? Lie down. I remember I told you this year, I think, but I know my dreams when I was in Bible school. Every night I would dream in one year, every night, once a week. I told you that I think the other time. I dreamt that five big black dogs were chasing me. And I ran, run, run, run. And I was so in my dream, it was so real that I was my bed was wet with perspiration. And when I run, I come to a fence and the dogs jump on me. And I wake up and my heart beats. I dream it once a week, it influenced me. I say, God, why do I dream that? I want to dream of angels. And I know dog speaks of uncleanness in the Bible. It does not speak of pets. And one night I'm so desperate. As I dreamed, that dream was torturing my mind. I said to the Lord, one year I dreamt that dream. It actually had an effect on who I was. And I was so desperate going into that little chapel. And I said, Lord, 
I'm not going to run anymore. Next time I dream this, I'm just going to let the dogs eat me. I'm tired of running. Amen. And I prayed it. I go up to bed and I dream this dream. And in my dream, I remember, I'm not running anymore. I'm going to stand up. And I turn around and my shaking like this. Five dogs jump at me. Eat me. Attack me. And I never dream this dream again. So I said to the Lord, what did you tell me in this dream? He says to me, you can't run from your life. You have to face your life. You have to overcome your life. You have to confront these things. You cannot run. This overcomer is not one who runs. It's a one who faces. And it changed my life, the dream. Bypassing my consciousness, moving into that, what the Lord does. What does he say? He makes me. He will make you to lie down. There will be a time in your life where you cannot run anymore. For God comes and he makes you. Will you stop running? And what does he do? He makes you to lie beside an in green pastures. When you come to a place of rest, it produces fruitfulness, freshness, greenness, speaks of fruitfulness. And only as he heal can he lead me. Now where does he lead me? He says what? He leads me to still water. Now why does he lead me to still water? Because you're out of the storm and you've been just in a boat and you thought you were sinking. No. You know why he leads you to still waters? Because in the still waters, you have a reflection. You know what it says in Proverbs 7, 27? As in water, face reflects face. So a man's heart reveals the man. Now, you imagine that. How do you know what you look like? Imagine if a guy goes to prison and he is uh, 20 years old. And he never has a mirror. He never has a reflection in the window. And what he, whoever will see what he looks like. Do you think he knows that he's aging? He has always in his face, he will always think that he looks young. He will always think that he will look the way he has seen himself 20 years before. And he has no idea because it doesn't hurt. You're growing old every day. It doesn't hurt. But you don't look the same. When sorrow and suffering forge your face. When no joy is there to delight your heart and your life. You will be amazed that after 20 years you will look in the mirror and you will not even recognize who you are. I remember the great story, I tell this many times, how the big, big Leonardo da Vinci, big painter, how he painted the picture of the Lord's Supper and he had all the 12 disciples and 11, but he painted Jesus and he had all the disciples reflecting the way he thought they looked like. 20 years he didn't finish the picture, at least what I read. 20 years because he couldn't find the Judas. He couldn't find that faith. He thought that face would look like when he betrayed the Jesus for $30, 30 seconds of silver, and he betrayed the Lord. And he said one day, feeding the pigeon, and he looked over on a bench, and there was a man ravished. He said, that's probably what Judah would look like if he lived. And he carried that guilt for so many years. It would show on his face and show on who he is. And he says to him, well, you want to earn some money? He says, yeah. So come up to my uh, studio. I'm going to paint you. Wow. And I'm going to give you money. So he comes. He doesn't care. 
And as he sits there and looking at the picture, suddenly he starts crying. He said, why are you cry?" He said, I'm crying not because the way I look. I'm crying because I'm the man who 20 years ago you painted as Jesus. And 20 years later, I'm Judas yeah. in your picture. Now what has life done in life? It has ravished him. He, had to, he could not see the reflection of Christ any longer. And you see, when he leads us to the still waters, and we can see him, what does happens there? When you not only see him in your neighbor's face, but you see Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's not just, I need to see Jesus. He needs to, I cannot just read the Bible to, to get a nice scripture for the day. I have to see him. I have to behold him because I can only become like him as I see him as he is. And if you don't see him, how do you become like him? So you get the word, faith comes to the hearing. But the likeness comes as you see him in all his glory. And this becomes a quiet water to reflect Christ. So as you read it, it reflects who he is in you to show forth what? His glory. Yeah. And then he leads me beside still water. What does he come with that? He restores my soul. The restoration of soul is so important. The restoration of soul. As you see him, there comes a life within you. You know, it's like Peter. He had his own ideas. When did he change as he reflected? He was lying on his bed and he had a vision. A vision came down with creepy and crowly and things, things he would not talk and things he would not eat. And what the Lord say in a dream? Rise, Peter, kill and eat. If he would not reflect it, he would never ever accept it, Nicodemus. Never. He would have never became the man who realized that it was not just for the Jews, that Jesus was born for the world. But how did he get the revelation to reflection as he saw him? As the Lord says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. You know what he actually said? If you don't kill and eat, it will eat you. And he had a reflection that he could do the very things the Lord told him to do. And you know, when the Lord tries to show America new things, we have to rise, kill, and eat. We have to see Jesus in these days because if we don't see Jesus, we will become like that culture. The church will be so confused because we will not know what Jesus is, who Jesus is. Some of us will think Jesus is a homosexual. <coughs> Some of us think Jesus is a gender. How can you see him as he is? As you reflect who he is, God is going to raise up men and women who what? Who have restoration of soul. Men, how many people have to have restored souls who have lived lifestyles which are not pleasing to the Lord? How we need restored in the church. It's not just an opinion. It's a restoration of what the Lord wants to do in our lives. He restores my soul. Now after he restores your soul, he can lead you. Where does he lead me to? He leads me in the path of righteousness. Now what's righteousness? Righteousness is an act of doing what is right according to the standard of his integrity. Now, when he leads me in the path of righteousness, that means I'm walking with right thinking, right behavior, right understanding, what God wants to do in our life. Because 
if you're not righteous, you know, self-righteousness and righteousness are twins. You can sometimes cannot hold them apart because self-righteousness comes out of your standard of what I think is right, out of mine. Righteousness comes out of Christ's standard. Me, I have to do what is right in his eye. I have to love what he loves. I have to hate what he hates. I have to do what he does. It does. If I don't, you can have right opinion, a formed an opinion, but still not do what's righteous. Now, God has to, I remember when apartheid broke down, how God changed even before apartheid broke down in South Africa. How God changed the church. How black and white mingled. How black and white, you know, the, uh, some of our friends, we lived for 10 years under apartheid. Some of our white friends never touched a black person. I took some of them to pray. They never knew what that hair feels like. Even so, they lived in an African nation. They never knew anything about the Africans, even so they were their mates, and even so they were helpers, but they didn't. And as God started moving before Mandela came even out of prison, God brought a new standard of righteousness amongst the church for black and white mingle, for black and white kiss, for black and white did these things God wanted to do the church. And you see now, if we don't work in righteousness, we're going to be influenced by governments. Because governments were dictators now. The church is rising up. Whoever thought that South Africa would have persecution to stand for Israel because the government stands for Hamas. Hey, everywhere you go, they praise Hamas. And here's the church in the middle of that where they're persecuted. And how do you ever think you were persecuted again, loving a Jew? That was the Lord do. He has to bring the church what? In a path of righteousness to think right in critical moment, to know what to do in critical moment. So because he leads us in a path of righteousness, not for our name's sake, for his name's sake. So that Christ can be lifted up. We can worship the Christ who becomes equal to us. And that when he's equal to us, you don't lift us. He has to be higher than us. He is the creator. But today people do, they love creation. You can see when we walk around and we're hiking, you can see people putting on stones uh, to energy. In Austria, I see people hacking trees. And they're trying to pro pro protect the earth and the creation. They have no power to protect. Telling us to eat snakes, don't even drink coffee, and, and don't have gasoline. Walk on your foot, eat bugs. Why? Because they develop an idea of a creation, thus they worship creation and not the creator who has created this earth. Yes. And you know, God's people, we have to come to the place where we don't worship creation, but the creator, because he has created everything. He has told us to eat. He has told us to subdue. He has told us to bless. And you walk in the path of righteousness. In verse 4, Yea, so I walk to the valley of shadow of death. I fear no evil, for thou art with me. You rod and you start, they comfort me. Now you can see how comfort is important. The Holy Spirit comes to do what? To comfort, to restore. Every prophecy has to have edification and comfort and exhortation. The prof a prophecy who does not have this three thing, it's not a right prophecy. Because every prophecy has to edify, to exhort in comfort, to make us at ease, to walk to the crisis of life with the ease of the spirit to know that I'm born for such a time as this. Even you walk to the valley of shadow of death, I don't know. 
It's not easy to die to self because the Lord speaks about you see, you have to be baptized into Christ. You're baptized into what? Into death. Now, to die to Christ, to die to self, and to live for Christ, you can't just say, I'm dead, I'm dead. You have to go to a process. Dying is a process. Everyone, some of us are sick. Some of us are just give up the ghost and we die. It's a process. And it's the same in the spirit realm. It's a process. Many Christians are not died, died for, to self. They're not baptized into Christ. They love the Lord, but they're much alive. They don't know how to walk. Here it's been, it's so what the Lord does. He brings us to valleys in our life where we actually have to make decisions to surrender. And I think America's in that place now. Mm. Now remember, when we surrender to the wrong occupiers, they will rule us. Germany had to surrender because we did not surrender to God. We had to surrender to the Russian, surrender to the American, surrender. And today nations are in a, in a, stra what would you say? Nations are in a stronghold. Because we struggle to so don't know where we surrender. Mm -hmm. Now, when you surrender, any surrender means that you have no weapon, you have nothing to defend you, mm -hmm. you surrender. When he brings us to the valley of shadow of death, one of the things which you fear is evil. Because death is the last enemy. Death is what Jesus Christ has conquered. Death is the things even many of us don't want to think about. And you know, when I think about it, my, I actually be releasing things. we giving things. Because we're actually coming to the time of our life where you don't incorporate want things anymore. I don't buy souvenirs anymore. I don't buy certain things anymore. That's why we give our books away, because we want to make surrender. Our lifestyle has to become different now as we walk and we, especially me, David is younger. As I end at the time and the season where I know that God has to do something with me, is not reaching big goals, it's just yielding to his purpose and yielding what my life was all about. And you see, all of us, our life comes to a closing in our life. And for, for totally to be walked to the valley of shadow of death, for, for I will not fear evil. Because evil, when you feel and you feel your body decreases and the things you used to do easy are not so easy anymore. And you feel that in your life and you struggle with things, just with physical things because of the decline of your body. Now what does the Lord say? As you decrease, I must increase. The balance has to be right in your life. And here David been to many valleys of shadows of death. He fought many wars. He knew what he was speaking about. He was almost conquered. And you know, in an old age, when you're young, you can think you can conquer it single-handed. But when you get older, even David had to experience it. When he slew the giant, he almost was got killed. Because he had no longer the strength to slay the giant, he needed his nephew to help him. And what did the nephew say? Don't fight these battles anymore. We just need you as a light. Mm -hmm. In Jerusalem. You don't need to fight these battles. Now you need to be illuminated and the light in Jerusalem. Mm. And that's it. Yeah, so I walk to the valley of shadow of death. I fear no evil. Why? Because thou with me. Your rock and your staff, they comfort me. Remember, the rock speaks of authority and it speaks of support. Who you decrease, he increases. Who you weak, he is strong. Because God has always the right balance in your life. And David speaks about it. And this is the life. I'm telling you, you Psalm 23 is a map. 
You cannot get away from it. David speaks about it so clear. He lived through it and he saw into it what the Lord has. He says this, then you prepare a table in the presence of my enemy. Now prepare a table, you know what the Lord speaks about. He's, when he speaks about the table, he speaks about feasting, eating. He speaks about stimulating your appetite. He speaks about enlarging your taste buds. Now I'll tell you one thing, when you have an enemy, you don't feel like eating. And there are many God's people who are spiritual anorexics, who have no ability to eat, even so God set the table in the presence of the enemy because they have not been comforted. Now to eat and to enjoy food and to enjoy what God wants to do, you have to be at ease, even when your enemy is there. You have to be comforted so that you can have moments. Now, one of the things which is so important, what the Lord does, most Christians don't know how to feast. We have certain taste buds developed, which we like, and some things we don't like. But it doesn't mean they're not good. Just because you don't like sour doesn't mean sour isn't good. Just because you don't like bitter doesn't mean bitter isn't good. Just because you don't like salty doesn't mean salty isn't good. Now, if your taste buds are underdeveloped because your enemy is stronger than your desire to eat, you will never be able to feast. Because to feasting means you can enjoy the things the Lord gives and you can eat and partake of his goodness, of his fatness, of the riches. When you're not, when your enemy tells what to do, he gives you, the Lord prepares a table and you don't feel like eating because the enemy becomes bigger in your life mm. than the table itself. And you see today, we have huge enemies. Enemies out there who are going to destroy America. Enemies out there who are going to change our lifestyle of our kids and grandkids. Now, if the church refuses to eat, if the church refuses to eat from the Lord's, from the Lord's table, which he prepares in the presence of our enemy, mm -hmm. we will have no strength mm -hmm. to become what he wants us to be and to Walk in that what the Lord has. And I'm concerned about America. I feel the burden for this nation. I love this nation. Mm -hmm. I was so proud to become an American. And millions and millions of people coming in here, they don't want to be Americans. Mm -hmm. God said, not God, the enemy sends people in to destroy this nation. Mm -hmm to take away our liberty and our freedom and our ability. Now, how are we going to, I said, God, what am I going to do? What can I do? I'm not going to do, go uh, in anti of, in right to life marches. I'm not flying to Washington. I'm not standing in, in front of clinics. I'm not doing this and that I have. What can I do, what I do? And I realized, but I got to do these days to be comforted, to, to walk in strength, eat, eat of his goodness, eat of his kindness, eat of his love, eat as he prepares us a table in the presence of our enemy. Mm. What else? He anoints my head with oil, my cup. See, eating and anointing goes together because we have to eat and partake of Christ-likeness. So the anointing comes in our life. So he anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. I not full of goodness and mercy. They shall follow me all the days of my life as I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. forever. The Lord is my shepherd. I 
shall not want. He makes me remember. He will make you to lie down in green pasture. You won't think he makes you, but every night when you go to bed and you're tired, he makes you. He makes you to submit. He makes you to rest. So he can move in, in the rest, to give you a new dream, to give you new courage, to face the morning with a new spring in your step. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still water. He makes you lie down, but he leads you like a shepherd leads the flock. So he can look into the still water and see Jesus as he look in the water of life. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name. Yea, so I walk through the valley of shadow of death. I fear no evil, for you with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy, my enemy. You anoint my heads with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David, come and pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the GPS that you give us, that you give us a way to follow, that you show us the way to go. And Lord, if we humble ourselves, that Lord, you will lead us through. And Lord, we will taste of your goodness and we will taste of your victory. Lord, give us a heart to follow you. For your scripture says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Yeah. Lord, it hasn't changed. And we know that we have to be willing to give up of ourselves, to let go of those things. In order to win victory, we have to overcome self with the power of the spirit. Thank you, Lord, that you would have overcome said that you we have been crucified with christ that that is something that has been done but lord now you have to give us the courage and give us the willingness to walk and overcome yeah. those desires lord it isn't an automatic thing it's a conscious decision every day as we choose to follow yeah. you and follow the spirit of god rather than our own fleshly desires so we just pray today that we will be a people who will will truly be true to you and love you and sacrifice and give all as the song we sang this morning give it all to jesus don't hang on to anything anymore but give it all to jesus that we can walk and the beauty and the resurrection power of jesus father i thank you this morning you'll touch those who feel lord that they need a new freshness in their yeah. life lord if someone is discouraged this morning someone is feels weary and downtrodden. I pray this morning the Holy Spirit yeah. will speak and will uh, comfort and will encourage, will inspire and touch that person this morning, Lord, in our midst that, Lord, that we might encourage one another to walk that walk and to stand together and lift up our brother's hand in the name yeah. of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're so happy. Uh, that God is doing great things. And if there's anyone here that really wants prayer, you know, we'd be willing to pray afterwards. And I'm just going to turn it back to Pastor Paul. Thank you for being here and thank you for your, your listening ears. If, means if you need prayer today about anything or if God's, you know, leading you to follow him more closely, please, yeah. come, up. please come up. Stay up here for a little while, but you know it's just so good to hear a good message that, that leads us to follow Christ yes. even deeper. And that, that's what He's calling us all yeah. to right now. Yeah. Listen, time short. Yeah, absolutely. Whether you're talking about your life or the period of time that we live in, the age of the church, it's all going to come to a close quickly. And God wants you to live for Him because. That's the only thing you're really going to have that will fulfill you. That's right. Is to live your life for him to the end. To 
the very end, to do everything you can. So whether you're young or old, you know, this morning, I just pray that you would, you would think about what was said today. Let the map of the Lord lead your life. Yes, yeah. yes. And we sang that song, Jesus Have It All. Please make that commitment today yeah. to, to let him restore your soul, yes, yes. to let him change your heart. Because God wants to do a work today. And listen, there are people sitting here that, that God wants to empower and wants to change and wants to use. And you're holding back. You're not letting him do what he wants to do in your life. You're, you're holding on to hurts. You're holding on to unforgiveness. You're holding on to the lusts of your flesh. You're holding on to things that maybe you learned as a, a young person. Or even holding on to religious things. And God's calling you to come deeper into Him and to have more. So please, if you need prayer today, come up. Sidney and David are here to pray with you. We can pray for you. Yeah. But don't go home today without being changed. And I just ask, you know, if the Lord put on your heart to give to their ministry, you can write a check to them and put it in the plate in the back. We're going to give as a church, but um, you can put your regular offering in there too if you want or whatever. But, but, they need your support. They're going to be going to Europe. They're living their life to the end, the end of the race, you know, serving God. And um, I just thank the Lord for them. And let's just, I want to pray for them. Yeah. So after we pray for them, if you need prayer, come on. Well, Father, we just thank you for the faithfulness, Lord, of this couple, Lord God, to serve you in all the days that they have walked. God, I thank you that they are not giving up and they're not stopping to bring the glory of God and the truth of his word wherever you lead them. Mm -hmm. So, Jesus, we pray today, God, that as they go out of this place, Lord, that the, the supernatural strength of God would continue to fill them. Lord, that they would hear your voice, even as Gwen heard that, that yeah. Uh, yeah. address years and years ago as she took the Bibles, Lord God. I just pray that you continue to speak to them where to go where to go next and for each of us lord to hear you in that way to develop a sensitivity to your spirit god to have a walk with you where we hear yes. you speak god and to know where you want us to go and where our efforts should should be made lord. Yes. so god we just thank you this morning we pray your blessing on our friends here on this couple of the language lord god bless them so yes. much as they go forth i pray in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, if anybody needs prayer, come up to us. How you doing, though? Yeah. 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 Yeah.